Well, good morning again. Good morning again. It's great to be together. Um, this morning we are continuing on in our Deo Lingo series. This is a series that we started last week by looking at baptism. And it was a great service last week, wasn't it? It was really, really special as we gathered together and declared that we belong to Jesus. Uh, but a reminder, um, a reminder, and indeed for those who were unable to make it along last week, during this series, Deo Lingo, we're going to be taking some of the words which are commonly used in church and actually take the time to explain what they mean. Uh, because sometimes we can be guilty in the church, us preachers in particular, uh, of using words which aren't commonly used outside of the walls of the church building and we just assume that sometimes that everybody who gathers actually knows what they mean. So right off, right off the bat, this is my public apology for every time that I have stood here or in the main sanctuary and started speaking in a language which perhaps you did not understand or comprehend and then didn't take the time to actually try and explain what the words we were using meant. So as we journey in this series, as we translate the language of the church into words which we can understand, we come together this morning to consider the Trinity. The Trinity. And this is not something which can be easily comprehended. It may also come as a surprise to you that the word Trinity doesn't actually appear in either the Old or New Testament scriptures, yet it is a doctrine. The doctrine of the Trinity is one which is widely accepted and widely spoken of in church circles. In fact, you may or may not know this, but as a denomination within the Church of the Nazarene, we have 16 of what we call articles of faith, which are confessed within the church. And actually, Article 1 is about the Trinity. It's about the triune God. And it's going to appear up behind me here. It says and states that we believe in one eternally existent, infinite God, sovereign creator and sustainer of the universe, that he only is God, holy in nature, attributes and purpose. The God who is holy love and light is triune in essential being, revealed as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of Christianese words even in that statement, isn't there? That you're kind of going, well, what does that even mean? In other words, what this statement declares, whenever we say that we believe these things, it's we are stating that we believe in the triune God, that we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we said, whilst the word Trinity does not specifically feature in the scriptures, there are many verses which mention or allude to all three members of the Godhead or the Trinity that refer to the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit within them. We see at Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16 and Luke 3 and 22 which will appear up on the screen for example where it reads that the Holy Spirit descended upon him, that is Jesus, in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son, that is the Father's beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Or again in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest <coughs> measure. So whilst the word Trinity doesn't appear in the scriptures, there are several instances. If I went through every instance, we'd be here until probably a half one, and nobody, no, I don't even want that. So nobody wants that. But <laughs> Whilst it's not explicitly mentioned, there are numbers upon numbers of verses where all three members of the Trinity are mentioned. Even right at the beginning of Scripture in Genesis chapter 1, God speaks and he says, Let us create man in our own image. Let us 
create man in our own image. So although the word Trinity is not explicitly used, the reality of the Trinity is found throughout Scripture from the start right through to the finish, from Genesis to Revelation. But you're probably still asking the question, what, what is it? What is it? You're saying that it's mentioned, you're saying the word that we use for it, but what is it? What is the Godhead? What is the Trinity? Or perhaps a better question is this, who is the Trinity? Now there have been a number of different illustrations which have been used down through the years to try and explain the Trinity. And, and I know that we work well in word pictures and, and illustrations and that sort of thing, but I am so sorry. I cannot give you an illustration this morning because perhaps you've heard the Trinity described as like water in its three states, liquid, ice and vapour, or perhaps you've heard the Trinity described as being like the sun in the sky where you have the star, the heat and the light, or perhaps you've heard the Trinity described as a three-leaf clover or how the same man can be a husband, a father and an employee or employer. The problem whenever we try and use analogies like this, however, is that in an attempt to try and explain the Trinity, that we fall into a trap of speaking some of the ancient heresies that were rejected by the early church, such as modalism or partialism, for example. So to try and explain the Trinity away in, in terms and in illustrations and in pictures, I'm really sorry this morning, it's quite frankly impossible for me to do that. So why are you preaching on it? Why are you preaching on it? It's another fair question. Preaching because it's important that we understand, in part. Because you see, the, the Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is only able to be understood through faith. And it's best confessed in the words of one of the old creeds, the Athesian Creed, which says that we worship one God in Trinity and unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are propelled by the Christian faith to confess that each distinct person is God and the Lord, and that the dead is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory and co-equal in majesty. And again, you're sort of looking at me going, what? What does that even mean? So I've got a picture that doesn't try and explain it away, but helps to illustrate something for us. In the middle here we have God. God is the Father. God is the Son. I wasn't anticipating the real clicks there. And God is the Holy Spirit. But as God is the Father, as God is the Son, as God is the Holy Spirit, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and in the same way, the Spirit is not the Son. Right? There's no hierarchy in the Trinity, no one person is superior to another, and each person glorifies the other as well. So the Father glorifies the Son, and the Son glorifies the Father. The Father glorifies the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit glorifies the Father. The Holy Spirit glorifies the Son, and the Son glorifies the Holy Spirit. Who's confused? Right? I believe for us, because I'm confused too, that's why it's a mystery. But I believe for us to understand this reality better this morning, and consider how on earth the Trinity applies to us Monday to Friday, in our everyday lives, it's important for us to consider each person of the Trinity individually. So for the next few moments, we are going to do just that. So naturally, we start with God the Father. God the Father, there is so much that could be said and so many ways and names in which he uses throughout the scriptures and throughout history to reveal himself. It was he who created the universe and everything in it. It is he who is omniscient, that is, all-knowing. It is he who is um, omni- uh, uh, Sorry, I'll start that again and breathe. It is he who is omniscient, 
that is all-knowing. It is he who is omnipotent, that is all-powerful. And it is he who is omnipresent, that, is, that means that he is everywhere. So God the Father, in his great mercy, set a plan in place to save us from ourselves. Knowing and loving all that he had created, God knew that though he loved his creation and still loves his creation, that we would turn our backs on him and that we would disobey his commands and that sin would enter the world as a consequence. So this father, God the Father, would send his own son to take upon himself the sins of the world that those who place their trust in him would have relationship with the Father once again. You see, God the Father is the epitome of holiness. Nothing is too hard nor too difficult for him. There is no darkness in him. We only need to step outside the doors of the church and look across at the big mural and we see darkness, don't we? We see darkness in our everyday lives. We see darkness in our communities. But there is no darkness in him. There is no sin in him. He is sovereign. He is in complete control and nothing catches him by surprise. Has anything happened in your life this week that you've kind of taken a step back and gone, wow, I was not expecting that. I know there has been in my life, but nothing catches him by surprise. And in his holiness, he is, he is fair and he is just. And because he's fair and just, Sin, therefore, cannot be tolerated. Yet, in his great love for us, he gave us free will. He didn't force us to follow after him. You ever done something under duress? You ever done something you didn't want to do because somebody made you do it? See, when my girls don't want to go to party, they won't go to party. Right? But you know what I'm talking about. You do. But God in his great love and great mercy does not force himself upon us. But he allows us to choose. He has given us free will. Because love doesn't force itself. But, made, but he has made a way that we might be forgiven of this sin which causes us to fall short of his glory. God the Father, nothing is too hard for him. Nothing is too difficult for him. He is the great I am. He is almighty God. He is creator. He is sustainer. He is love himself. He is the definition of love. Yet despite all of this, he cares for us. He hears our prayers. He answers our prayers. And he reveals his love to us and is at work in our lives. Peter, in his letter, encourages us to cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. Everything God the Father does is motivated by his love for you and his love for me. He is our Abba. He is our Dad. He is God the Father. God the Son, or Jesus Christ, is perhaps the most referred to member of the Trinity. We believe that he was eternally one with the Father. In other words, we believe that he was not created, but that he has always been that he was present with the Father and the Spirit at the creation of the world and breathed life into humanity. We also believe that he took on flesh and dwelt among us and was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. We celebrate this birth at Christmas time. I get excited when the kids go back to school. And it might be sort of too early for some people, but Christmas is coming. We're on the march. 
right? All you need to do is go and step into B&M Bargains or Home Bargains down there at Collinswater and you'll see exactly what I mean. But Christmas is so much more than that. Christmas is the time where we celebrate and we rejoice in the fact that God took on flesh and dwelt among us. And we believe that this was a real turning point in the history of humanity. We also believe that whilst he was here on earth, he was both 100% God, yet 100% man, which an equation which I've told you before used to drive my atheist math teacher up the wall, used to drive her absolutely bonkers. But the same Jesus, God the Son, died for our sins. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. The wrath and debt which was on our head was freely taken upon himself in an act of redeeming love that we might have relationship with God the Father through him by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And just as he took our sins upon himself and died our death on a Roman cross at Calvary, we also believe that he truly rose again on the third day, just as he had said that he would. This same Jesus, who went around Galilee, bringing healing to the blind, the lame, the leper, bringing justice to the orphan and the widow, respecting women and challenging earthly authority, declaring the need for us to turn back to God, to repent for the kingdom of God, was near. The same Jesus laid down his life so that we could know freedom. And as he died, we believe that death could not hold him. For death was swallowed up in victory and death lost its sting. And as he rose again, he did so victorious with the keys of death and Hades in his hands setting the captives free and bringing victory over death. And as surely as he rose again, so too did he ascend, where right now he sits at the right hand of God the Father and is praying for you and for me, interceding for his own. God the Son, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity has made it possible through his death and resurrection for us to have relationship with the Father. To know the joy of sins forgiven, the joy of his salvation, and as the way, the truth, and the life, he is the only way to the Father. He alone is our reward. He is our wonderful Saviour the propitiation for our sins, the giver of life and life in all of its fullness. Not only in the world to come, but in the here and now as well. John writes about Jesus at the end of his gospel, that if everything he did were to be written down, that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would need to be written. Our wonderful Saviour, God the Son, God who took on flesh and dwelt among us, God who calls himself our friend. And as we sung last week, what friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Do you know him this morning? For he longs for a relationship. Do you know him? Or do you know about him? Because there's a difference there. Then to God, the Holy Spirit. Down through the years, there have been those who have referred to God, the Holy Spirit, as the forgotten God. A great book by Francis Chan, bearing the same title, is well worth the read if you get the opportunity. Sometimes we forget whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit, quite sent from God, is God Himself. We believe in the Holy Spirit. 
who is the third person of the Trinity. We believe that he is the gift of God which was poured out on all flesh at the day of Pentecost. And that he is ever present and active in and with those who believe in Christ. Whenever one comes to Jesus the Son, repenting of sins and seeking the forgiveness of sins, we are told that they are marked, we are marked with the seal, and God the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who moves by his prevenient grace to convict the world of sin, who woos and draws individuals like you and me, who wooed and drew me and many in this room to the Father through Jesus, the Son. It is the Holy Spirit who upon the repenting of sin and believing and trusting in God, who does the mighty work of transformation in our lives, changing us into new creatures, into new creations, where the old has gone and the new has come. Who's thankful that they're not who they were whenever they first met Jesus? I don't know about you, but I'm so glad I'm not who I was back then. And he continues that work within us. We're told, Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. That means that he's still at work in each one of our lives. He is our advocate. He is our helper. He is our friend. And he works by his sanctifying grace to change us. He changes our attitudes, our outlooks, our thoughts and our actions to look more and more like Christ and to become his ambassadors, his representatives here on earth that others too might come to know the joy of sins forgiven and the relationship with God. God the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. He is the Spirit of wisdom of understanding, of counsel, of might, of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. And he leads us in all truth, reminding us of all that Jesus has taught us. He is the one whom Jesus promised to the disciples whenever he needed to leave them and go to the cross. He said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will leave you my spirit, an advocate, a helper, a friend who will remind you of all that which I have spoken to you. I once heard the Spirit of God, this third person of the Trinity, described as that wee voice in your head. And I looked at the person and I said, Well, what do you mean? I said, Well, how do I know that that's not me? How do I know that's not, and um, that's, 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 that's that, that that is the Holy Spirit. And they simply said to me, well, if you're walking closely with the Lord, we're told that his spirit and your spirit intertwine. And that we are given of his spirit. And as we are sanctified, that and becoming more and more like Christ, he prompts us. He reminds us. He shows us the way. For he is the spirit of truth. And I want to encourage you. Why well, don't hear the spirit talk to me? See if you hear that wee voice in your head. That's telling you to go one way or to go the other. If that way in which the voice is telling you to go is not contrary to the scriptures. You can probably bet it's the spirit of God. Prompting you and moving in your life. God doesn't just speak through clouds and big loud booming voices but more often than not he speaks to us through his spirit as we open his word and as we walk and talk with him. And you remember that old hymn I come to the garden alone 
And the wee chorus goes, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. That's the Spirit of God at work. So in conclusion, the Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is only understood through faith. This morning, might we know that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that God himself is for us and not against us, and that he loves us with an everlasting love, that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become righteous before him, that he who created the sun, the moon, and the stars, who created every animal in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters, who created the very waters themselves, that this creator God, whose motivation is love, has given us his spirit that we might live in the freedom which he brought, bought us by sending his son to die his death. So do you know him today? Do you trust him today? For his word tells us that today is the day of salvation and he welcomes us with open arms when we come to him with repentant hearts. So I know that's been a lot this morning, but it's important that we understand. And if you take nothing else away, know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is for you, now and always. Let's pray together as the band. Lord, we praise you that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, we worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. And we thank you for the truth of your word. And we thank you that you are interested in each one of our individual lives. And that you meet us at the point of our need. Lord, we praise you this morning that you choose to reveal yourself in the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we pray that we would live in the confidence that you're for us, not against us. And we pray to the Father, through and in Jesus' name, by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen.